Good morning. So I should say thank you to Aubrey for the invitation to come and speak to you here uh, and tell you about what we're trying to do in Cambridge about a different type of approach to immunotherapy. Um, the talk's going to be in three parts. So the first three slides will just be the justification of why I'm talking at an aging conference. Um, the second part of the talk will be actually explaining the basics of immunotherapy. And I think this is kind of important because I'll give you a review of what, what a lot of the type of approaches are, but I'll do some very fundamental science at the beginning on the immunotherapy because I think it's very important to kind of understand that mm -hmm. so that you can actually get a pretty good idea for yourself what's important and what's not because this field is moving at a very, very fast pace and there's a lot of hype as well in it. And then in the last few minutes, I'll tell you about the work that we're trying to do in Cambridge and a different type of approach of a cell-based cancer immunotherapy. And the idea with the talk or the purpose of the talk is twofold. Uh, one is to get people from here to come to work with us in Cambridge because we're kind of recruiting and this is an area of importance. And of course, the second is funding because nothing works without the funding. Okay, so I'll start off by talking about why I'm talking at an aging conference. And that's because essentially, can so this is a slide from Cancer Research UK, and cancer is basically a disease of aging. So the incidence of cancer begins to rise quite sharply in patients after 50. And this is the same pretty much everywhere you look. So here, this is data from the uh, Australian Society, and you can see again whether you're male or female, your incidence inc begins to increase pretty significantly after you're 50. But far more importantly, not only do you get cancer, but the mortality from cancer also begins to rise pretty sharply. So the issue with this is not only that you get cancer when you get older, but you also die from it. So that's why it's important in the conference on aging for people to begin to think about this, because if you're thinking about undoing aging and longer time points, then this is something we need to be concerned about. And that's because the primary reason for this increase in cancer with aging is the fact that from a young age, you begin to accumulate mutations and the numbers of mutations, somatic mutations in cells are basically what cause cancer. So unless you can eliminate mutations completely, you will always have this problem. So the longer you want to live, if you undo aging, you have to tackle this issue of cancer. And although this sounds pessimistic, I mean, there is hope on the horizon. And this is just beginning to think about the fact that before where we had chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery, all one had was short time extensions and it was hit and miss where they'd worked. And you didn't have long-term cures. But the new kid on the block is this thing called immunotherapy. And this is really transforming the treatment of cancer. So why the excitement in immunotherapy? So this basically started scientifically in 2013 by science announcing cancer immunotherapy as the breakthrough of the year. Nature followed in the next year. And of course, it's never out of the press nowadays. And you talk about um, it, I mean, it broaches on all kinds of things. One, because it's long-term survivals now, so that's one of the reasons for excitement but there's huge amounts of money to be made from it as well, and that drives it as well. From a scientific point of view, the reason that there's been a lot of interest in this is because in 2015, there were about 10 different types of immunotherapy that were actually being licensed by the FDA. And this began to really take off in terms of numbers. So in 2016, they approved, the FDA approved immunotherapy for a number of different cancers and these are cancers that are found all over the body. So it's pretty well applicable to many different types of cancers and it's not targeted to single cancers. And that resulted in the American Society of uh, Clinical Oncology naming immunotherapy as the advance of the year for two years in running in 2016 and 2017. And what that was about was a type of immunotherapy called checkpoint blockers. And I'll explain what these are in some detail. And interestingly enough, this year, ESCO has named the advance of the year another form of immunotherapy, and this is what they call adoptive cell therapy. And this, in other words, uh, or other names for this is 
something called CAR-Ts, and I'll explain about that a little bit in a little bit more detail. CAR-Ts have got an enormous amount of publicity because there's huge amounts of money involved in this, and as people will know, I mean, with valuations on companies like Juno and Kite, that's what's been driving it. But that's why I want to kind of explain some of the basic science, because then you can judge for yourself whether it's you know, reality or hype. Okay, so the, from a scientific point of view, what, is, what has been the paradigm shift? What has been the change in terms of the question about immunology and the use of immunology to treat cancer? And I guess for all the members of us in the audience who probably know, uh, I mean, there was great hope in the 90s where people began looking at monoclonal antibodies and these, because they were highly specific, people thought they could target to individual cancers and there was a huge amount of work done which basically failed. And the, everybody called these things magic bullets and that, because it failed, everyone kind of stopped working on most of the cancer immunology. And what we didn't realize is a very simple thing. The simple thing is that antibodies and B cells don't kill tumors in any system that you actually look. The primary things that actually kills tumors are these things called killer T cells or such toxic T cells. And these are the effectors that actually give you the immune response that we're talking about. So I'll, I'll skim over the kind of outline of what, the, what actually goes on and then I'll explain a bit more in detail about what actually happens at a cell biological level because I think that's quite important to understand. So basically what happens is tumor antigens are captured by a cell called the antigen presenting cell and are now shown with signals for activation to inactive T cells and act these cells are then activated by seeing the antigen and getting other signals as I'll explain. And these activated T cells now, if they are loaded with weaponry or they become killer T cells or cytotoxic T cells, can now go and if they find the tumor, eliminate that tumor. Okay. But in terms of biology, this is not the end of the story. And the reason is because activated T cells are really dangerous things. As some of us might know, if, you, if people remember almost 10 years ago, there was a trial done with an antibody called TGN 1412, where people um, who developed this antibody actually tried to just activate all T cells in patients with cancer. And most of the patients that they tried in the phase one almost died. Okay. And I'll explain why. And so in the natural system, what you actually have now we understand in stimulation of the T cell or activation of the T cell, a whole batch of receptors that can activate and a whole bunch of receptors that can inhibit, okay? Because you want to be able to control the T cell because it's a dangerous weapon. Now, these are the, this is a summary of all, basically most of the things that are being developed at the moment, but they're not all equally important. So for example, the most important one with regard to activation is CD28. And what that antibody TGN 1412 was, was an antibody that hit CD28 extremely hard to activate T cells, and that's what the the issue was. In these, the two most important ones are CPLA4 and PD1, which I'll tell you, but there are people developing various different antibodies against all these molecules in a way of either accelerating the activation or inhibiting in some way, shape, or form. So to understand the basic biology, we can start from a set of slides kindly donated by Jim Allison, who is the guy who started this work, basically. And so, the fundamental biology of, of T cell activation is this. So what you have is an antigen presenting cell and a T cell, and the T cell sees an antigen that is presented by the antigen presenting cell, and T cells see antigens as little peptides or little fragments of proteins that are stuck onto molecules called MHC molecules or histocompatibility molecules on the surface of cells. But they also require, and, and what happens in the system is the fact that the antibody, the antigen that the T cell receptor is designed to see is there, gives the T cell a signal, signal one, that tells the T cell, hey, what you're designed to see is here. But that's not sufficient to activate that T cell, okay? And this is an internal control mechanism in the system. What you require is a second signal, which is given by a different pair of ligands, so TD28 here, on the T cell, and the antigen presenting cell has this called 
B7. And these are upregulated in the case of most types of infections, if you like. Okay? So the innate immunity that you hear about uh, is primarily a, a means of switching on, on these types of molecules within antigen-presenting cells so they can now activate T cells. Okay? And what happens in the system then is you get activation and this can become a, a cytotoxic T cell. Okay? However, like I told you, the real problem is the fact that the cytotoxic T cell is a dangerous beast. So what actually happens in terms of the cell biology is that you'll see in here, there is another molecule called CTLA-4, which is the inhibitory receptor, but that's actually on the inside of the cell. And on activation of the, of the T cells, when it becomes a cytotoxic T cell, that molecule is put out on the surface, okay? And this is the reason why, because it's a means of controlling the CTL. Because now you get signal one, which is an activation signal that tells the T cell that the antigen is here. But the second signal, which is via CTLA4, is actually a blocking signal, which doesn't allow this cell to proliferate and it inhibits itself. Okay? So this is a way of control. And what Allison re realized, of course, is that it would be possible then, if this, if this happens, that if you had an antibody to CTLA-4, you could block this molecule so that now all the molecules begin interacting through CD28. So they all got activated. Signal one and signal two is the activation, and this is called T-cell potentiation. And this is basically what the, the basis of checkpoint blocker are. So the question is, does it work? And this is the first experiment that Jim and they did, and this is a crucial experiment in animals that they did to show that it worked. So th there are a couple of points I want to make on this which are kind of important for you to realize. So this is the mouse model. So it's clean, the mice had no tumors, no pre-existing T cells and such like. And he gives this with a vaccine which is mashed up tumor, if you like, okay? What's interesting in this system is you get tumor growth if you use nothing. If you put the antibody against CTLA on its own, nothing happens. If you put the vaccine on its own to activate the T cells, nothing happens. Okay? If you put the combination of the two in, then you get wiping out of the tumors. Okay? And the reason that this is the case, of course, is because for this antibody to work, of course, you need to have activated T cells in the first place. Right? And giving the, the mash will activate it and having the antibody will potentiate it. And so this moved quite quickly into humans. And you can see here that if you put the vaccine on its own in humans, nothing happens. If you put the combination, then you actually get an effect. What's interesting in humans is that you also get an effect if you have the antibody on its own. And that's because the history of tumor development in, in, in individuals means that by luck, some people will have activated T cells, and that's what you see. Okay. What this result doesn't show you is all the people who were treated who never actually had any responses. So these are all only the responding people that are in, in here. Um, the other thing that it doesn't tell you, of course, is that the side effect profiles are quite severe and a number of people died in some of the earlier studies and still do. But the biggest excite excitement was the fact that where you begin really seeing this effect is at the longer time points that you see. So when you do the, the, so the much bigger phase two, phase three studies, then you have to compare it with the method of treatment, currently which is chemo. And you can see here with another antibody against, in fact, a different checkpoint inhibitor, CD1, that in fact, you get a significant difference. And more importantly, this is actually seen much more markedly at the longer time point. So this is in melanoma. And to show that this, ap this approach works in lots of other tumors now, there's masses of data now on about almost a dozen different types of, of tumors. And this is uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma. And you can see that there's a much better with survival response than there is with chemo, particularly at longer times. Okay. If you compare this with targeted therapies, so you look at, for example, kinase inhibitors in the case of renal cell carcinoma, you get the same effect, which is a much better response and much better overall survival over longer periods of time. And of course, because there are many different checkpoints, now what everyone has been interested in is combinations of checkpoints. And the question is, 
is two better than one? And the answer is it is, because if you put the anti-CTLA on its own, you get a response. If you put the NTPD1, you get a response, and the combination gives you a much better response and survival time. So, does this solve all the problem? So no, there are two issues here. The first issue is cost, which I guess a lot of people here will not be kind of hugely concerned about because it might just be an NHS problem in Britain because we pay for treatment, but, it, but these are horrendously expensive because the combination treatment is about half a million quid per patient. Okay, so that's a serious, sorry, there's a serious issue with regard to that. But a second far more important problem is this question here, which you, which you can see, which people don't really publicize in a great way. And that's that if you look at the numbers of people responding in each of these treatments, I mean, you're only getting to about the 20 or 40% treatment. So the, the real issue is the immunotherapy approaches that are currently there with the antibodies don't work in most patients. And the second thing I told you is the question about serious adverse effects. And people don't talk about this, but in fact, more than 50% of the patients treated in any of the trials actually drop out because of horrendous side effects. And if you think about what I was telling you with regard to the activation, you can understand why straight away. Because of course, the reason you have checkpoints is to actually keep activated T cells under control. So if you have T cells killing your liver or killing your kidneys, the point is that the checkpoints allow you to delete them. If you block the checkpoints, of course, you release the brakes on all activated T cells. So the one that were killing your liver or killing your kidneys are still doing that. Okay, and that's why people have horrendous side effects. So for example, in Cambridge, where they, the, there was a melanoma patient treated with the combination checkpoint for, mal for melanoma, he actually had to stop treatment a couple of times because they had massive infiltration of his liver. And that's because there was this damage. So the question is, is there a better way of doing this? Right? And so if you think about it now, and this is a slide from Roche that actually has been developing a number of the checkpoint inhibitors, we now realize that this is actually a cycle. And the reason it tends to work really well in people that it works in is because you tick off the cycle and you go through it. So, so half of it is about capturing the antigen from the tumor and presenting them on antigen presenting cells. And the second half is actually for the activated T cells to go around, hunt the tumor, and kill them, and, okay? And this is now known that, so if you want to improve immunotherapy, you have two options. One is to actually vaccinate using the antigens if you're interested in. And the second, of course, that people began thinking about is what happens if you, because the T cells, the activated T cells are the things that are important, what happens if you try and just take T cells of the patients and expand them and such like? And this is called adoptive T cell, and that works. And the most sophisticated way of doing that is to now take the T cell and put in it an antigen that you can design and engineer so that this now becomes a killer with the T cell that you've got. And this is essentially what CAR Ts are about. So that's chimeric antigen receptor T cells, okay? And this is what all the big hype about is about because CAR and Juno are, are companies that do CAR Ts. But what people, what you have to realize is that you have to have an anti, antigen receptor that you engineer against a tumor antigen that you know, okay? And that tumor antigen has to be present on all your tumor cells. So that restricts the number of things that you do with regard to CAR Ts. And in fact, CAR Ts have only been shown at the moment to work with CD19 and 20. And we can discuss that later if you want to know why. So a better approach might be the question about vaccination. And what you have to understand there is the question about antigen and antigen presenting cells. So just to refresh your memory, what happens in T cell uh, activation and why antigen presenting cells and cancer antigens are the key is because the antigen presenting cell first shows the T cell the antigen that is supposed to recognize, the cancer antigen, okay? And that gives it the first signal. And then there's a whole batch of activation signals that activate these T cells. Okay. And this presents a problem because you have to know what the cancer antigen is. And what we know now from a whole batch of you know, numerous gene, gene sequencing programs for cancer antigens, that you get huge heterogeneity in tumors, okay? The end result of being that if, if, if different people have the same cancer, they have different mutations. And even within individuals, 
you have individual tumors, you have lots of genetic mutations, okay? So tumor antigens are patient specific. So the question is how do you solve this issue? Okay. And this is going back to looking at a cycle. And as you can see, there are many different ways of actually interfering, but there's a very simple way if what you're interested in doing is treating an individual patient that has an individual set of mutations. And that is to take the patient's tumor cell and the antigen presenting cell, the dendritic from that patient, and if you fuse them together to make a fusion hybrid that puts all the antigens from that patient's tumor into the antigen presenting cell and it can activate all the T cells against that tumor. So, the, so basically you can use DC fusions to actually initiate the cancer cycle. Okay. Does it work? Okay, so here's a map that we had for looking at this treatment in multiple myeloma. And the reason for trying, trying it in multiple myeloma at the beginning was because in fact all, this, all the people who do transplants, stem cell transplants for treatment in, in the world do these in hemopathic tumors. And that's because the dendritic cells come out from the blood and you can culture them. And you can take the myeloma cells from the bone marrow and you can do the fusion. Okay. And the phase two clinical trial was done at the Bat Beacon by some by other workers, by Avigan and Rosenblatt. And this is a slightly more complicated protocol because all those patients receive transplants and these patients either get the vaccine before the transplant or some patients get it before and after. So there's two cohorts in this trial. And this is the data from the two cohorts. So cohort one, who received only a single vaccination after the transplants, you can see that at day 10, you've got responses in pretty much about 70% of the patients. About 30% get complete responses. And this improves significantly post day one. Okay? There's really very little difference between the two cohorts in terms of the vaccination protocol. So you see complete responses in more than 50 day patients after te day 10. And these patients are now alive for nearly seven years. The most interesting thing about this type of treatment is the fact that the safety profile is actually very good. So if you look at the safety profile, the only thing that was ever seen in the 35 patients was actually grade one, grade two event. Okay, so the question is what are we doing about this? And the answer is that this is what we're actually planning to do in Cambridge now, which is to set up a unit and develop better methods for fusion at the beginning, move that into GMP production, and then that will go into a clinical trial. So in summary, what I've told you is Immunotherapies are the better way of treating cancer. They've given you unprecedented results. The first generation is already here, second and third generations are there. But then the future is actually personalized dendritic cell based therapy. Thank you.